This is a cup of coffee, cup of tea kind of uh, conversation. We're going to be very, very casual. I'm just going to have a chat because I wanted to ask a question. I have no idea what my answer is, actually. So I'll just answer it together with you in this conversation. What are the psychic consequences for the aggressor in this war and for the victim? Who is going to be more psychically scarred? Is it going to be the Russians or is it going to be the Ukrainians? Now, quite obviously, nobody's dropping bombs on the Russians. Um, in fact, as far as concrete, tangible actions, nothing much is happening with the Russians. Their economy is going down the hill. They're getting the abuse online for being aggressors, for being responsible for a regime that's dropping bombs on maternity hospitals. Um, but at the moment, it's clearly Ukrainians who are under assault. Um, Vladislav Atroshenko, the mayor of Chernigov, which is this city in Ukraine that's about 1,300 years old, was saying just hours ago that children in his city, young children in his city have stopped speaking because of the trauma of war. And uh, he said that 40% of all buildings have been obliterated. Not hit, but leveled, according to him. So we know quite a lot about the trauma of war and we know that there's a lot of kids in Ukraine, a lot of children who are going to need a heck of a lot of therapy um, and a heck of a lot of adjustment to life conditions that accommodate ongoing trauma um, and somehow allow it to be balanced with leading a fulfilling life. Humans are endlessly amazing. I mean, there are some people who would, won't be traumatized at all by having bombs dropped on them. So we, we are very, very remarkable beings. And so what's going to be wrong for Ukrainians having gone through this terror is pretty, it's pretty obvious. Um, so why would anyone say that the Russians could be affected more you know, are they just talking about the cumulative suffocating effect of the sanctions, destroying Russian economy, Russian society? Well, that's not what I'm interested in. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about being traumatized because bad stuff is being done in your name and you're kind of, sort of, part of it. However you want to cut it up, you're sort of, kind of, part of it. Um, and that's interesting. And that's particularly interesting in the context of so many bad things happening in Russian history in the 20th century, especially, that haven't been acknowledged. And now we often talk about the United States and how um, eye-wateringly unprocessed the Vietnam War is in America. You know, the Vietnam War for all too many in the United States is like a past relationship that one's in denial about having had at all. So, you know, what what was the relationship about? What happened in it? Why did it end? Why did it start? That's all sort of just blanked out. And rather the way the United States relates to the Vietnam War, Russia unfortunately relates at the moment to all of its history. Um, and this is really important and worth emphasizing because a lot of us in, in the West wonder, well, you know, how do they relate to all of these horrors? Because we know that um, the state has never acknowledged that these things happened, which is the diametrical opposite of what's happened in Germany. Um, the formal position of the uh, Russian regime, uh, as expressed a couple of years ago by Bortnikov, the head of the FSB, is that Stalin's repressions killed about 700,000 people. So they're admitting that. But they're basically looking at a reasonable representation, actually, of the number of people who were directly executed. They're not looking at the people forcibly, deliberately starved in Ukraine, 4 million, 3.9 million or more. They're not talking about the ethnic cleansing, ethnic populations being put on trains, half of them never even arriving alive to the destinations. They're not talking about the camps, you know, uh, which were 
not killing sites the way the Nazi concentration camps were, but they were killing sites, just less directly. And so the Russian state is underestimating how many citizens it killed um, or how many citizens its answers to the Soviet Union killed by a factor of at least 20. So there is no acknowledgement, there is no processing, there's no formal recognition. And what's really bad about this is that for all too many Russians, it's not like they have a, have a rosy uh, eyed view, a rosy tinted view of Stalin. It's rather that they're kind of in the realm of magical thinking about Stalin. It's not that Russians are walking around and saying, well, actually, Stalin wasn't that bad. Because that kind of denial you could actually make inroads into. You can deal with it. Because you can say, well, you're wrong. You say Stalin is a bit bad, but actually he's not a bit bad. He's very, very, very bad. But instead of saying that Stalin's not as bad as, you know, historians make him out to be. What Russians do is engage in a kind of magical thinking where Stalin becomes a kind of cipher onto which you can project anything you want. You see what I mean? You see the difference? It's not that he is being um, excused or he's ethically rescued, resuscitated. It's rather that he's becoming a kind of magical figure that doesn't stand any concrete historical scrutiny is almost like a kind of label you can use, a kind of box you can deploy, out of which you can get anything you want, into which you can put and keep anything you want. And so there is a kind of a magical thinking about Stalin um, that is very, very disturbing. So that's just to give you a little bit of a sense of how f screwed up um, and how much intergenerational trauma Russians carry. And you can just see this if you go to Russia. You can just see this if you look at, um, you know, road rage. Road rage here in the UK is you effing C word, watch where you're going. Road rage in Russia is going to be much more like I'm going to dismember you. You know, I'm going to rip off your arms and your legs and you'll crawl around on the earth helpless and nobody will come to your rescue. Guys, you, you, you didn't even crash into each other. You just had a bit of a mild near miss. What's this conversation about tearing off limbs about, guys? Come on, get back in your cars. Crazy Russians. So... There's a, it's a culture that's really screwed up. The, the culture doesn't have as much immediate PTSD as there is in Iraq or Syria, where you really have so many folks who are just ready to jump under the sofa when the doorbell rings. You don't have that, but you have a heck of a lot of crap. And Ukrainians are a bit lighter with this. They, they carry this weight less for several reasons. One is... Um, they can just blame Moscow. So Ukrainians can look back upon all of this awful Soviet history in which they were great victims themselves, uh, particularly with the Golodomor and these four million folks being deliberately starved by Stalin in the early 30s. But they can just say, well, look, we didn't do it to ourselves. It's Moscow that did it. And now we've got Kiev and Kiev is not Moscow, so we are externalizing the horrors. Whereas for the Russians, the horrors are at the very center of their state, still at the very center of their culture. Another difference is that Ukrainians didn't do that much, really, to process the Soviet horrors. They just kind of plodded along. But the Russians sort of made their own horrors worse. It's almost like they went to an evil therapist instead of, like Ukraine, not getting any therapy at all. And the evil therapist has been this ghastly propaganda that has been pumped into them for almost 20 years now under the Putin regime that is, has generated a kind of phantasmagoric, psychotic way of thinking about one's past. 
That's very, very disturbing. And you can see it in Putin. I mean, before he invaded Ukraine, he made a speech with historical references. And you can see that he's, I mean, he's historically illiterate and he's got this porridge of crap in his head out of which he is concocting these things. Um, many of them are historically falsifiable and barely make sense. And so it's the phenomena of not being able to relate to your own past as though it's real. Um, and so Ukraine is in a slightly better place with this. Um, so you might say, well, hang on, how is this going to be relevant to um, Russians who do get that the war with Ukraine is terrible? Because aren't these going to be the same Russians who think that Stalin is a, is, is a mass murderer and they aren't going to have this problem processing the past? But, 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 but it's not that easy. It's a bit more complex because they, they belong to that culture. They're part of that culture. That's in, you know, it's, so they're kind of living in, in a family, if you like, where most members of the family, most members of the household do have this really unhealthy relationship with their past. And so they are affected by it very, very much. And now this stuff is being done sort of in their name, sort of not in their name, you know. And at the moment, I think what's happening to a lot of these Russians is they're feeling kind of ethical crisis. A lot of them have run away from the country. And if you, you know, think that these Russians know where they're going, no, they don't. They just left. Some of them went to um, Georgia. Some of them went countries in other directions and they don't know what to do there. They don't have a life there. They just ran away in a kind of moment of practical and ethical crisis. <clears throat> and I think a lot of Russians are in the kind of state of um, engaging so much with a sense of blame, self-blame and self-persecution um, that they're not really engaging with it properly. Because, of course, one way of avoiding a question is to ask it repeatedly in, in a neurotic way. So if I go around saying, um, why am I so fat, why am I so fat, why am I so fat, that's not going to address the reasons that I'm so fat. That's not going to liberate me to actually face wherever I'm at and look at how far I've got um, a weight issue because I am, I've got some immune condition or because I have some unhealthy patterns um, or because I have some self-loathing that's causing me to eat 700 packets of crisps every day. So a lot of Russians are asking these kind of persecutory questions at the moment, but they're not really facing it. And what is it that you would face if you were facing it? And I feel I'm facing it to some degree because I'm whatever I am. I consider myself, let's say, 30% Russian and then West European, the rest of my identity. Or another way of putting it would be to say I'm 100% Russian, um, but um, I'm also 100% Central European and 100% Western European. And these are all sort of parallel um, tracks that inter, inter penetrate with each other. Mm. So whatever you say, here's basically what's painful for me at the moment um, is two things. Uh, the main one is that I have some part in a culture that has in one particular dimension failed really, really badly. Why are bombs dropping on Ukrainian kids at the moment? It's because Russia, this culture, over the last, let's say, 140 years, because that's when I would say was the period of the biggest opportunities. In the last 140 years... Russia has just failed to develop any kind of remotely decent way of organizing its politics. So why would such a remarkable culture with so many great contributions that it made to the world, particularly in the literary arts, why would a culture like that just be so completely unable to get its crap together politically. Like, why is it so screwed up? You know, like, how is that even possible? 
Um, and because I have some part in this, I, I feel a degree of responsibility. Just like I must say, um, you know, being a British citizen for a quarter of a century, I feel some responsibility for Brexit. I am against Brexit, but I'm part of the culture that generated it. And so it's the result, even though it's not the result I wanted, for which I take some responsibility. And on a much more radical level, with this war, because I have some part in Russia, I often, with Russia, I often joke, you know, I often joke that my relationship with Russia ends, you know, with the death of Chekhov at the beginning of the 20th century. And that's true. Almost all of my love of Russia is caught in the 19th century, somewhere between, you know, um, 1830 and the very beginning of the 20th century sure that's where i'm at but still i'm i have something at stake this stuff is 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 about me to some extent i i i i'm involved i'm a part of this situation and so i'm a part of a situation of such relentless and spectacular pants shitting that that culture did all it could do is relentlessly and repeatedly shit its pants and then shit on itself and then shit on the world for decades and decades and decades and decades. It had opportunities to come out of this. It had an opportunity in 1999. It didn't use it. We got Putin. It had an opportunity in 1991. It began to sort of kind of slightly use it, but it never consolidated it, wasted it. We had an opportunity to avoid the revolution. We had lots of opportunities to avoid the revolution, which is the biggest turn in all of this, really, um, in the 1910s. And the Tsarist regime was relatively healthy in many ways. That opportunity wasn't taken. A previous opportunity in 1881 wasn't taken when a very constructive and progressive Tsar was killed and it was replaced by a repressive Tsar, Alexander III, who is Putin's hero, even though Putin doesn't know anything about him really either. Which shows how much Putin is caught up in magical thinking about the past. And so I feel, yeah, it's a bit like having... A kid with issues and then the kid goes out and does something bad that's how one feels that you know one is part of that culture and one feels um, that bombs are dropping on the heads of Ukrainian children because your culture has shat itself in a particular dimension and that's n that's a part of why I have been so emotional about this war and then, of course, what makes the war more emotional, and this is part of the mental health aspect that we're trying to explore here for sure, is that Ukraine is a separate culture to Russia. Ukraine is a separate culture to Russia. Ukraine is the same culture as Russia. So I've said two times that it's separate and once that it's the same. That's the economy of sentiment that I personally adhere to. Um, because I've often been corrected in the last few weeks by people who say, well, no, Vlad, you can't say that it's bombing, Russia's bombing its own people because, you know, uh, the second president of Ukraine, Leonid Kuchma, wrote this book called Ukraine is not Russia. And that's exactly true. Ukraine is, is a culture now that strongly identifies itself in opposition to Russia, of course. And Ukraine is culturally different from Russia. And Ukraine's um, uh, arts are also significantly uh, interesting and distinctive from, from, from Russian arts, from Russian literature. So you've got cultural differences there but it's so close it's so close and that's why in the end you can't get rid of this image that this war is like manchester bombing london and there's something really sick about that it's horrible if paris bombs london it's horrible but it's not as sick as manchester bombing london it's not as sick as north carolina bombing south carolina it's the big aspect of this. And the correction, no, 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 no. It's like it's like England bombing Ireland. You know, Manchester, London is a bad example. Wrong. Wrong. You completely miss something 
absolutely central to why this is so sick what's happening that this bandit in the kremlin is bombing his own people because for any russian of sensibility bombing kharkov bombing chernigov is the same as bombing Voronezh, bombing other Russian towns. It's basically the same. Um, and so you've got to admit both. You've got to say, yes, Ukraine is certainly not Russia. It's a separate uh, culture, two peoples, not one, but also not. And unless you say also not, you're not going to understand just how horrible what is happening is and how sick it is feels and particularly how sick it feels to Russians which is a kind of it feels like a kind of extraordinary act of self-harm almost I've just turned off the camera and forgot to give you your conclusion because it's two in the morning I'm so sorry here is the conclusion Ukraine is in a dire place if we look at it today then we can see that one in two half of Ukrainian kids have been displaced from their homes. That's combining external displacement, folks who've had to flee the country, and internal displacement, folks who've moved from one place in Ukraine to another. Half of all Ukrainian kids. Um, so we are going to need a lot of psychological work there. But if Ukraine holds and doesn't allow Russia to do a regime change, then there is every prospect for Ukrainian culture to be in a really quite a healthy place 10 years from now. And you can't say that about Russia. We have spoken a lot about the Russians who do get that this war is bad, but are struggling to process that. But then, of course, there are the Russians who don't know what to make of this war. And then there are the Russians who support this war. And I think they're going to be in a bad place 10 years from now. Um, just because it is unhealthy, particularly in the context of all of this historical blindness we've discussed, it's unhealthy to engage in yet another um, act of violence upon one's closest brothers and sisters with so many elements of um, sadism as well. Um, that is part of the motivation of those who fervently support the war, clearly. Um, so I think the collective sort of cumulative conclusion is clear. If Ukraine holds, if there is no regime change, there's every chance that Ukrainian culture will come out of this much better and that Russian culture will come out of it much worse with more collective trauma, with more intergenerational trauma, with more screwed upness. So unfortunately, as a result of this war, collectively, Russians are going to be um, 10 years down the line, more screwed up by this than Ukrainians, even though it's the Russian government who is the perpetrator here and Ukrainians who are the victims. Thank you so much for joining me for this chat. See you very soon.